Welcome to Original Mind Zen Sangha. Today's Dharma talk is given by Andre Taysan Hallo. Two weeks ago, when I was talking, I forget the name of the. I think it was called the the Buddha on the the Buddha on the altar. Um, I I touched upon a point that I'd like to elaborate on today. <clears throat> so tonight's talk will be called Purity of Practice, and I only can say that with about half giggling because I keep hearing Brigadier General Jack Tripper, Jack Tripper, Jack Ripper, from Dr. Strangelove and his obsession with purity of essence. If you've seen the film or familiar with it. So, you know, one of the, I think, important tensions in any uh, spiritual tradition, Buddhism specifically, is uh, this question of authenticity and how much cultural accretion does a tradition acquire throughout several thousand years and at the kernel of it is you know what is how how true is the current practice or teachings to the the originators um original vision and i think you could see that all um that tension that anxiety echoed all throughout buddhist history where uh, many sects like to claim that they have they've cornered the the market they have the real deal buddha dharma and everybody else has some watered down version of it or something that's been tainted or somewhat corrupted by outside influences but when we look at it when we when we look at buddhism at least in east asian buddhism in particular i'm talking about zen chan song we see you you know you study and you see that there's an enormous amount of fingerprints from all these different cultures and all these different practitioners with different priorities and it's as far from this ahistorical thing that many uh buddhists would like to claim ideally somehow the story goes that the buddha passed down his enlightening experience non-verbally to mahakashapa and on it went through to bodhidharma and eventually made its way to to china but of course i think if we were to <laughs> if you were to ask the the historical buddha shakyamuni a, a kongan uh this was not at all inside of his practice this is a, a chinese buddhist development and it's perfectly fine the same way as vajrayana is a tibetan buddhist um expression part of the dilemma might be in being a western practitioner is with uh, is is not falling into the trap of why we got there in the first place many people were looking for something and so they project onto buddhism or maybe yoga or hinduism whatever their adopted practice is they're the, the the very same uh priorities and needs that they came to the table with in the first place so when somebody's uh, trying to get ironically somebody's trying to get away from metaphysics the metaphysics of western abrahamic religions they just go looking for those same qualities inside of buddhism and so now we've replaced uh the soul with buddha nature and god with or angels and bodhisattvas and uh this glorified buddha which can become ensnaring on the other hand uh if we completely abandon our tradition and we jettisoned it entirely, what are we left with? Well, we could just be seated meditation. I've sat with groups where uh, they, not, they consider themselves Buddhist, um, and for them the quintessential expression of Buddhism was the seated meditation pose. The problem though, of course, is then when we talk about that word about quintessential, because it begs, the, begs naturally uh to the the question of essence itself which buddhism is for the most part patently opposed to this 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 uh, belief that there's some sort of core thing that makes buddhism buddhism or makes me me so perhaps a way around that is if we turn our attention away from beliefs away from the philosophy of 
some sort of um, ontology, belief in either a spiritual essence or intangible me that transcends my body. And if we turn our attention to the very same thing I was talking about two weeks ago, which was the Buddha on the altar, not literally, but the Buddha on the altar perhaps being an expression of our practice. So instead of aspiring to become a Buddha, which, which itself is problematic in that it's like kicking the can down the road. It's, it's assuming that we're going to achieve something that we don't already have. Uh, but instead of doing that, if we can turn our attention to our practice, our moment-to-moment -moment practice. So as I was sitting in meditation, I took my glasses off because I was sweating because I closed the door. So my dog wouldn't come in here and visit us with his Buddha nature. <laughs> so there's no AC inside the room circulating the air and all. So I got a little warm. Well, that's my practice at that moment. And rather than trying to skirt around it <coughs> and, and change um, my circumstances, which I otherwise would have if I weren't here talking in front of you guys, I would have opened the door and got a glass of water. But that didn't seem to be possible. So instead, we sit with the circumstances that we can change and uh, accept those that we can't. So if, uh, we, if we can reorient ourselves and focus on our practice, um, I think that brings us to the, the first couple words of the Dharma Talk's name, which is purity of practice. Well, what does it mean to have pure practice? It seems extremely idealistic and a slippery slope that could lead us right back to where we're, we're, we're beginning from, which is trying to purify something into some ideal state. The more we try to shape and mold our practice into um, a means to an end, in the same way as you would go to the gym in order to lose weight, put on muscle, whatever it is, um, decrease your blood pressure, lower your cholesterol, all fine pursuits, but not what Buddhism is at all interested in, because all those are objectifying the practice so that it's, it's, it's goal-oriented. If we could somehow abandon all of our needs or let them go for a moment of trying to shape and manipulate our lives to make them the most desirable, satisfactory, if we could somehow put that temporarily on hold and just observe it, I think our practice becomes, for lack of a better word, transparent. Meaning we can't put our fingerprints on it because it's not a thing that we're doing in order to get something. Instead, it's just the same way that we blow, we, we, uh, we blow our nose or we brush our teeth. Or when you have a shiver run down your spine, Somebody asks, why did you do that? <laughs> Shiver. In Taoism, this is called uh, Wu Wei. Actionless action. And I think the benefit of this approach is that it pushes us away from the pitfalls of a belief system. Uh, Buddhism is a, a very proud, pats itself on the back quite a bit when it talks about precepts. It doesn't have commandments. It has precepts, which are pointers for how to live your life. And yet, very often we just turn uh, the Buddha's uh, teachings of the Four Noble Truths into these hard, concrete facts to be, to be uh, digested rather than investigated. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is that if we can turn 
our lives into a question mark rather than a period, into a, into a process of inquiry, just where we keep coming back and back and back to our lives at the present moment, trying to broaden our acceptance of it, loosening those goals, then we don't need to call ourselves Buddhists. we're practicing the buddha dharma which i think is a less dangerous way of looking at it even if it is just dancing around with terms so i encourage everyone to put down their expectations when we practice and that when means Every moment that we're aware, moments that we say, <clears throat> opportunities to awaken are infinite. Each moment is infinite in our, in our capacity and our opportunity to accept it with openness and charity instead of closing it off. And closing off doesn't just mean try to push it away, but to try to turn it into perhaps a, uh, a stepping stone to some greater realization. Thank you. I'm going to go get that drink of water I mentioned.